started. Okay. So, hello, Doug McGuff. Uh, my guest today, or just sort of a, more or less an informal consultation. Uh, and I'm looking um, just to sort of give a little bit of preamble and what I'm looking to do today with uh, Dr. McGuff. And uh, I've been doing this now for about 45 years. And of course, over the years, I've read books and articles and watched podcasts. And, you know, it started to occur to me after a while, say, Rick, you've been doing this as long as many of the people are longer than most of the people whose work you're reading and watching and things like that. And over the years, you know, I've, I think I've made some distinctions um, about various things. and. One of them is that the difference between good results and optimal results is probably very small. And a lot of the hair splitting that goes on, uh, and I'm looking, part of this is I'm looking for you to challenge me on stuff, mm -hmm. right, if you don't agree. And a lot of the, even not just arguing and hair splitting, but even a lot of the studies, uh, you know, that turn around and say, we did this for eight weeks or 12 weeks or 16 weeks, and this got better results than that. And part of me is kind of going, who cares? It's eight weeks, it's 12 weeks or 16 weeks. Nobody's working out for 12 weeks or 16 weeks. Uh, I mean, unless you're a competitive athlete who is training for a specific period in time, an event or something like that, where you have to optimize for a specific date, most of us are training for life. And yeah. so whether or not you uh, are getting optimal or good results, as long as you're heading in the right direction continually over time, because nobody uh, can exceed their genetic limits, whatever those happen to be. So, you know, we're only going to mm -hmm. be able to do what the ge genetic, genetic uh, hand of cards we were dealt with anyways and maybe so better results, whether we get there six months sooner, six months later, a year later, whatever it is, occurred to me that that's kind of irrelevant. And also whether you get to, because probably nobody actually gets to 100% of their genetic uh, potential because that would involve having everything dialed in perfectly over time. But whether you get to 92% or 94% or 95% or whatever the number happens to be, again, I think is largely irrelevant to the average person who's just trying to improve their quality of life. So far, we on the same page? Yeah. Um, let me elaborate on a few things. One is the difference between good and optimal being really small is, I believe, true. But also, I believe it is true that to go from good to optimal risks um, pushing the limits of adaptation to the point where you run off the rails and set yourself back to the extent that even good results may be delayed for a long period of time because of the attempt to optimize. Right. So there's that component to it. Um, next, you spoke to the fact that um, you know, and I agree, all these studies are 12 to 16 weeks in college age males, fill in the blank, blah, blah, blah. They are meaningless for lifelong training, in my opinion. Um, and even if that were true, you mentioned the fact that if they were actually an athlete aiming for a particular date of competition <clears throat> at, we, at which they wanted to reach this optimized peak, um, that might be true in that case, but I would like to point out that I think the benefits for resistance exercise in most sporting events, unless it is a particular type of competitive weightlifting for which you are training that skill, um, the benefit of the resistance exercise towards performance in sports is probably in the realm of benefit being 95% injury prevention and 5% performance optimization. Right. So that again falls by the wayside. Um, the other, when we speak about realizing our genetic potential, you and I, and a lot of people that are interested in muscular hypertrophy are really referring to their genetic potential in regard to muscular hypertrophy. 
But if we speak of true genetic potential for an optimized performance in life or in a sport, um, realizing one's genetic potential may result in a lesser degree of hypertrophy rather than maximum hypertrophy. Because the maximal hypertrophy that we seek may actually cause a interval degradation in performance in any given task. We just don't know. So if you're talking about just maximizing muscle mass for visual appearance reasons, yes, but genetic optimization um, might actually result in um, a, a body type that actually has a little bit less hypertrophy. Um, so there's lots of um, assumptions baked into the cake there that we really got a question when we're asking all these questions. But I do think that it's true that um, a, a basic, well-constructed approach that seeks good results over the long, long term is going to be the way to go. And um, hair splitting and optimization probably results in a degree of anxiety and stress that probably compromises recovery and adaptation to a significant degree. So, and one of the things like the part of this is I'm looking at either writing an article or even doing this in my Toastmasters group as a speech. And my working title is, you know, uh, it's too long, obviously, but something to the effect of ar arguing over the best way to straighten deck chairs on the Titanic. Yeah, and where I go, I, I'm thinking about things you've uh, I've read that you've talked about the therapeutic window. Uh, I think of hormesis and how you know sometimes something good, good, good for you and bad for you. Whether we're talking about exercise, where we're talking about lifestyle habits, we're talking about food, whatever it is, um, right. is I think a, a a real oversimplification of things because. Again, with a therapeutic window, it's more of a Goldilocks thing. Too little of something is not good. Too much is not good. And where's that that happy medium? But also, you know, I got to thinking about your definition of health, which mm -hmm. I have here on this other screen. Um, hang on here. Did I? Oh, darn, I didn't have everything on here. Oh, no, there it is. Yeah. Uh, a physiological state. Let me just share my screen here. I don't know whether when I share this or not, whether it'll show up on the recording, but I'll read it out loud. So that way there, if it doesn't work out, it is. So a physiological state in which there is an absence of disease or pathology, and that maintains the necessary biologic balance between the catabolic and anabolic states. So, you know, I've given that some thoughts. So I have a, a some questions to ask on that uh, because as a lay person I could be making erroneous assumptions now am I I'm under the understanding that every cell in my body like if you and I are having another conversation in five years from now mm -hmm. that nothing that is present in our respective rooms today will be there in five years all the cells that we have now will have died and new cells mm -hmm. will have uh, replaced them. Is that is that accurate? Yes. Yeah. I mean, now, we'll have turnover of all the material, all, all of the cellular material over the course of time. So, you know, a year or two from now, when we speak to each other, we, we look like the same guys, we recognize each other, but every structural component has had the building blocks of it turned over. So if my understanding is when we talk about protein synthesis and protein breakdown, often we talk about that in the context of muscle, but that process is happening with every single cell in our body. Yeah. And my understanding is that different cells do that in different intervals. For example, you know, just to say silly things here, the ones in my nose might turn over in three months and the ones in my heart might turn over in three years. And there's different yeah. speeds. In but general, so the rate of turnover has most to do with which germline embryologically the tissue derives from. 
So the germline that turns over the fastest is the ectodermal germline, skin, hair, fingernails, um, things of that nature. Um, the next uh, quickest or the intermediate turnover rate is the mesodermal germline, which is muscle, organs, things of that late nature. And then finally, um, the um, neurological germ rot line, you know, brain, nervous tissue, that turns over at a much slower rate. So nerve injury is going to heal at a much slower rate than a scrape on your skin. A tear in your muscle is going to heal at a slower rate than a scrape on your knee. So asking a layperson's question here. So cells die. <clears throat> the cells are not reproducing per se. C cells die. How did how are new cells born? I like I don't understand the process here. Is there, there there's not like magic? Well, it depends therapy. on the tissue. I mean, all cells have some sort of germline um, replacement um, kind of standing in the wings to be replaced. So muscle cells have satellite cells, which are cells ready to receive the chemical signals to fully differentiate into a structural skeletal muscle cell. Um, so sometimes complete cells turn over. Um, sometimes the materials that make up the cell turnover. So you can have protein turnover in skeletal muscle. Some structural components may remain, um, but you may have complete destruction of a cell and a replacement with a satellite cell. So it just depends upon the circumstance, but structural elements can turn over. So proteins, just like the rest of it, they age over time and they have a very specific to be functional, particularly enzymes, they have a very specific three-dimensional shape and conformation that makes them functional because a lot of them have to function in environments where they act like lock and key. Um, and if the protein starts to degrade, it becomes misfolded and it's much better for that protein to be broken down, discarded of, and have a new protein come in that is the amino acids are assembled in a way where it is folded properly for its function. Um, so a lot of turnover occurs in that realm. Problem is, as we age, the, um, the, the DNA signaling um, that instructs that protein folding um, gets damaged over time. It's sort of like, a, you know, like um, David Sinclair makes the... Um, analogy of a, of a CD getting scratches on it so that um, it becomes harder and harder as we age to fold our proteins appropriately so their functional status is as good as it should be. So going back to the balance between anabolic and catabolic, mm -hmm. and one of the things that I want to cover is what sorts of things are catabolic, what sorts of activities or things are anabolic, mm -hmm and how they so, might be in different um, scenarios. Just, just to finish my thought a little bit. So another, you used the CD analogy. I've also heard the idea your DNA is like a photocopier and you it keeps taking photocopies of the photocopy of the photocopy of the photocopy. And my thinking is that if person's anabolic and catabolic states are out of whack, say from eating a whole bunch of industrial seed oils, having too much uh, energy coming in by eating too much and things like that. And those things get out of whack. Those photocopies, because the idea is the photocopy gets blurrier and blurrier the more you do. And if you stop and you look at, you know, when you were in high, you and I were in high school, you know, uh, 17, 18 year olds looked like 17, 18 year olds. A little while later, you look at a 55 year old, one 55 year old, might still look like he's 35 and another 55 year old looks like he's 80. And yeah. I'm just wondering is, is that sort of an element of premature aging because there's an imbalance there? Yes, to some, to a large extent, yes. So, you know, that statement that we made in Body by Science is one of the things that I am most proud of because it turned out to be one of the most correct things that um, I've ever said. And that was predating any knowledge of um, 
energy signaling within the body as it relates to mTOR and AMPK. So on the grossest signaling scale, your body um, is either going down an mTOR pathway, which is an anabolic pathway that signals an abundance of energy, an abundance of available biologic resources, and a time in which it is um, appropriate to be building up new and making new tissue. Um, and then the AMPK pathway signals lower energy states, which provides an opportunity to deconstruct and to clean up, so to speak. So it's a way, um, it's like your garage that you live in a house for 20 or 30 years, you start to accumulate crap and crap accumulates in your garage and you just keep accumulating. Um, and if you don't have a period of time where you're not accumulating, where you take a break and clean your garage out, then the opportunity for true productive growth in that space is compromised. And um, so there needs to be almost a 50-50 balance between when you have energy excess and you're building up new tissue and when you have a um, deficit of energy where you then have the opportunity to move metabolic pathways in the opposite direction so that you can clean out um, and discard of um, old cells, cells that have died and are now secreting toxic chemicals around their environment to other cells causing them to degrade, proteins that are misfolded and no longer doing their job as enzymes or structural elements. For instance, in skeletal muscle, if it accumulates too much damage and the actin and myosin filaments no longer interact with each other, they're still there, they're just not functional. So you're doing metabolic servicing of something that doesn't provide any functional benefit. Um, so it is important to have the period of time where you can clean out the old stuff so that you can make productive use of the time when you're building new things. But if you are chronically in energy surplus and mTOR is chronically overexpressed, then all you're doing is too much adding food. in new elements without an opportunity to clean out the old so that you just accumulate more and more dysfunctional debris and um, accelerate the aging process because you've not had the opportunity to clean out the garage, so to speak. So, yeah, and I remember you saying that this this state between anabolic and catabolic was one of the things you you felt proud of from the book. And as I think about that, and and maybe only ten years later, or however many years ago, when I first read the book and I heard of it, all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait a sec, I'm starting to actually figure out what he means. And it occurs to me when I talk about straightening deck chairs on the Titanic, is that when people are discussing and this is, I, I'm, I'm going to use exercise as an example, but I think this applies to general health and aging and everything. When people are discussing, you know, whether the strength curve on one machine is better than another machine or whether three sets are better than one set or, you know, whatever these things or whether you should, you know, position your feet in a certain way to do calf raises better than another yeah. way. Um, if if the catabolic and the anabolic states are not somewhere near some sort of balance, right? That is complete. All those things are completely right. irrelevant. Right. So let's put this in context of modern times. Um, you know, people enjoy being in the gym, particularly people with a genetic predisposition to show visible results. So the answer then becomes to want more and more of that. So you take anabolic drugs. So that increases your hypertrophy response and it increases the volume of work that you can tolerate and the frequency at which you can do it, but you are creating a disproportionate um, anabolic state without any downtime for the catabolic state to create appropriate turnover. So this is an overexpression of mTOR um, in the way that is concerning to be 
of negative health benefit. And I think to some extent that may be see why we see a lot of steroid users have significant health benefits and die prematurely. Um, because in order, it's kind of a funny thing and I've, and that's what Body by Science kind of uncovered for us, <laughs> is that in order to train as frequently as we want to train and get the results we wanted to, people started using performance enhancing drugs to get that outcome. But, you know, and we thought that that was the only way to get any sort of hypertrophy outcome beyond even the most minimal. But what I've found is that really a significant percentage of that is just changing the rate at which you can cycle the whole process. Stated differently, in the absence of performance enhancing drugs, if you can just learn to refrain from coming back to the gym, if you can learn to wait long enough, you will have a more anabolic hypertrophic response than you would believe is possible. But most people cannot bear to wait that long. And everything that you see on YouTube and Instagram and fill in the blank is a message to the contrary. And they point to these 12 week studies of you know, young male college students without a care in the world saying that, you know, a minimum of five sets per muscle group, minimum two times per week is what you need to produce optimal results. But in the real world of real people that have jobs and children and mortgages and other stressors, um, that's way too much volume. And that is not enough recovery time. And a lot of people end up giving up, or if they don't want to give up, resorting to performance enhancing drugs, when if they would just learn to modulate your, their volume and wait long enough to recover, the adaptive response actually does occur. You just got to give it enough time and be patient, but most people can't stay out of the gym that long. Right. And I, and I, and I would say I'm guilty, even knowing what I know, Oh, me too. I always shoot the mark all the time. And, uh, you know, just recently I've decided I'm going to do one full body workout a week, uh, which, you know, may still be too much. But let me, without going too far down that side. So mm -hmm. when I think about anabolic versus catabolic. So, for example, I think as the workout itself. And, and I'm probably over some fineness. So I think of the workout itself, and I'll just finish my thought, as catabolic, because during the workout, I'm, I'm creating damage. Although some people would say, you know, that's anabolic. You're working out. That's anabolic. And then I'm thinking, on the one hand, and this is part of where I'm confused and looking for your help, is probably the most anabolic thing I can do after the workout is sleeping and allowing it to happen. But then I'm thinking... That's maybe an oversimplification too, because let's say I'm bedridden because of an illness or something like that, and I'm in bed all the time, sleeping all the time. Uh, I will, I will quickly uh, atrophy, right? If I'm completely bedridden for a while, I mean, you can go a week or even two or three without working out, and maybe even benefit, maybe even have, uh, you know, benefit in recovering if you're doing day-to-day -day activities after your workout, but if you're literally bedridden, I think that you will atrophy quite quickly. So then that leads me to say, well, wait a sec now, is sleep anabolic or is sleep catabolic? And then I'm thinking, well, no, that's an oversimplification, Rick. It's in context of sleep after the stimulus is anabolic, sleep without the stimulus is catabolic. Am I uh, out to lunch here or rambling, or is that making some sense? No, that makes sense because what determines whether something's anabolic or catabolic kind of is dependent upon the signal that precedes the activity in question. So the actual working out in the gym, the lifting of the weights, the doing of the exercise um, actually is an initiating event for an anabolic process. So resistance training turns on mTOR and gets right. it ready. So if you think of it as a big, heavy stone flywheel, 
It's what gets the flywheel moving. And then if you have the necessary substrate to deal with the catabolic damage that occurred as a result of carrying that set all the way to muscular failure, then you can use the movement of that flywheel to, and it keeps going if there's substrate in order to respond to that adaptive stimulus. By the same token, laying in bed for a prolonged period of time is a stimulus. It is sending a biological signal that this organism is not moving and skeletal muscle is causing, and bone and every other organ tissue, is having a metabolic demand on the body that is unnecessary. If you're laying in bed and not moving, you don't need that skeletal muscle, so it'll be sacrificed relatively quickly, particularly if you combine that with poor nutritional intake. So people that are in the ICU that can't eat, maybe they have a G-tube in because they've had multiple trauma, they'll be given total parental nutrition with a relatively high protein intake because they're still trying to goose in toward to keep the anabolic process going despite the strongly catabolic signal of being bedridden. So um, it's more than just what the activity is in the acute phase. So you got to think not only in terms of what is the activity, but whether the activity is um, acute um, and significant change, or if it's chronic mild change. So acutely, um, the weight training stimulus activates mTOR and sets the stage for an anabolic process, even though acutely it is a very catabolic event but it is an, an acute spike event. It's not a chronic sustained um, event like being bedridden or in a cast or something of that nature or chronically stressed or being a marathon runner or a you know, Tour de France cyclist. Those are all very catabolic activities. And, and of course, you know, we're talking about the context of exercise and we think in terms of stimulus and recovery from the exercise. But the exercise is only one of countless stresses which are having these effects, right? right? Like you mentioned about the mortgage and the kids and worrying about world events and, and yeah. uh, you know, your job stresses and all these things. <clears throat> and, and, and so it's, it's, you're not just balancing. I mean, if we were lab rats, and everything else in our life, every other variable was controlled. And that probably wouldn't work either because it'd probably be stressful being a lab rat. But, you know, just for the sake of a thought experiment, where you only stresses and you only were dealing with exercise stimulus and exercise recovery would be one thing. But nobody's life is anywhere near like that. And so yeah. balance between catabolic and anabolic states is really complicated. And yeah. um, and, you know, life stressor really, um, you know, chronic stress is really catabolic. When I, before I, between college and med school, I worked for a year in a research lab. And we were, they created an, in rats, an animal model of um, essential or stress-related hypertension. And we had these rats in a little plexiglass block. And their tails would stick out through a crack in the block. And we had a little wooden dowel with a hole in it. It would slide over their tail. And then we would wrap surgical wrap around their tails so that they were kind of trapped in that box. At the front of the box was a little wheel that they could turn that had a switch on it. And then we would put a soaked electrode on their tail. And we would give them a flash of a light and a beep. And Right after that flash of light and beep came, they would get an electric shock to their tail. And that shock would stay on, and that would cause them to lurch forward. When they did that, that would turn the wheel, and a switch would rotate around and turn off the shock. Within a few deliveries of that, they figured out that they could turn off the shock by turning the wheel. So they would just sit there with the switch of the wheel right next to the switch 
And as soon as they got a shock, they would just go click and turn it off. They learned within two or three shocks, they learned that. So in order to keep the stress going, we had to create randomness of when a shock would be delivered or not to kind of keep the whole stress going. But that was the nature of the experiment to create the chronic stress in rats. And we were doing it for the purpose of hypertension. And it was my job to take care of the rats, to feed them, to weigh them and do all this stuff. And what I found was the rats that were randomized to the stress group, I could not keep weight on them. Right. Um, so just the stressor of that being administered to them was catabolic enough where even with the same child, they, they just could not keep the weight on. So, and most people's jobs cause them some stress, but usually that stress is of a nature where it's subliminal enough where you don't really recognize it. Now, certain careers like mine in emergency medicine, probably, you know, policemen, SWAT team members, things where it's clear that there's really high level, you can then appreciate the impact of stress. And what I found is I can do a really hard workout with big compound movements. And the next day, the physiologic response to that is not as severe as a really intense shift at work. Right. So even though what we're doing is very high intensity and extremely high on the stress scale in terms of a physiologic event, in terms of a truly stressful event, um, getting in an intense argument with someone, road rage event, um, or extremely stressful work, or being put under um, unrealistic false deadlines, things of that nature, you'll you'll figure out pretty soon that it takes a real impact on you that really affects your recovery capability. So am I hearing acute stress with, uh, you know, short lived, but then a chance to recover might yeah. be good. Acute, and chronic acute, stress. Severe, right. Acute, severe, episodic, episodic stress usually results in favorable adaptations. Chronic, subacute um, stress is more catabolic and more produces negative adaptations. Which, which that's another part of my thinking is when I hear people talk about the benefits of saunas and or cold immersion, it occurs to me that it's not the heat or the sauna or the cold per se. It's just you're subjecting yourself short term to some sort of extreme that your body is not used to and whatever right. it is. So it's not the heat or the cold or the exercise per se. It's the idea of an acute. Yes. But even with the acute stress. stressors like our workouts, those have to be taken in context of what are the other more chronic long term stressors in your life, because even the acute epistotic stressor, if you have too much of the chronic subacute stress, that can be turned into a negative event. And that's why when I see all these podcasters, you look at the guys that are advocating the ice baths and the saunas and, you know, you hear them all and it drives me nuts. It's like, so what's your morning routine? Oh, I wake up and I drink, you know, element electrolytes. Then I meditate for 15 minutes and journal and I go out and get first morning sunlight. Then I come in and I do my ice bath. It's like all these people doing these podcasts are men in their mid forties that are not married and do not have children. <laughs> and it drives me nuts. I'm sick of hearing it. You know, I'm like, okay, Andrew Huberman, go get yourself a wife and some kids and some real responsibility and a mortgage. And, you know, um, one of your kids becomes ill or has an accident then come back and talk to me about, you know, first morning sunlight and meditation and journaling and whatnot. You know, people don't live those kind of lives. People live real lives in the real world with significant chronic subacute stress. And that's why we have to really be careful to modulate our acute stressors in an appropriate context where we can still recover and adapt. 
Well, and again, the 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 con the mistake that's made in so many things in life is if a little bit is good, more is better, and and nobody realizes this. That's why the catabolic versus anabolic that balance thing because. You know, people will say, well, ice baths are good, so I'm going to do them every day. And yeah. uh, sauna is good, so I'm going to, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll do an ice bath in the morning and I'll do a sauna at night. And then they sort of, and then, whereas it's sort of, yeah, there's probably some benefit, but it's not, I think it's just exposing ourselves. I like periodically, episodically. And I remember one time, uh, in a different context, you had talked about supplements and vitamins and the idea that it's good to not be so consistent and miss days and whatnot so your body right. doesn't get used to it. And I would think that's probably true uh, of uh, of these things too, is to do them every now and then, maybe for one day, one week you do it three times, the next week you don't do it at all. And how yeah, much they actually, what's that? Intermittency does help, I think, with regard to the whole vitamin question. I mean, someone can just Google or go on Google Scholar and look up, you know, steady state pharmacodynamics and see that, you know, if you do something so, so consistently, the, the agent reaches a steady state in the bloodstream and at a certain point, absorption and utilization plateaus also, and you might be better off with a lot of um, vitamins and nutrients with their pharmacodynamics to do them intermittently because you're um, not going to be at a steady state level and your absorption and utilization is going to be better than if you just right. take it every day religiously, you know. Um, another thing to circle back on something you talked about earlier is about, you know, getting the perfect movement with the perfect mechanics and the perfect strength curve and the positioning of your toes and I find that funny also. You, you see guys on the internet talking about the three different movements they do for their triceps. Well, you know, that muscle is very simple. You know, it attaches to your electron process that extends your arm regardless of what position your hand is in. Um, but with regard to perfect strength curve, foot positioning, this and that, all these little nuances um, fall by the wayside and are solved by the Hahnemann size principle of motor unit recruitment. As long as you're going at it in a way that you are accumulating more and more fatigue, so you're using a greater and greater percentage of your ever decreasing strength, you are tapping in and fatiguing every available motor unit that's there. So um, tiny little nuances in strength curve and body positioning you know, are obliterated by the fact that if you train hard enough, you're going to recruit everything you've got. And you don't need multiple movements or different angles of attack and things like that. You know, all the movements in the kinetic chain, and I mean, all the muscles in the kinetic chain involved with that given movement. If you train, you know, slow, smooth, no momentum, accumulate fatigue to the point that you reach muscle, reach muscle failure or close to it, you're going to have recruited everything in that chain. So extra movements, different angles, blah, blah, blah. It all just gets obliterated by the physiology. Right. Well, and like I said, straightening deck chairs on the Titanic type of thing. And yeah. that, so food, so anabolic versus catabolic. So forgetting macronutrients for a second, uh, just overall, when you have an energy surplus, i.e. you're just eating too many calories, period. So maybe I should define that. Too many calories, more than what you need for your daily energy levels. I guess we, we can't ignore macronutrients completely. You have to have enough protein for what's needed for, for uh, synthesis and bodily repairs. And then you've got maybe a slight excess for... Uh, you know, a little extra muscle if hypertrophy is even your thing. But beyond that, chronically, so that, of course, if you've had the stimulus and you've set the mTOR in path and you need, you mentioned a substrate, in other words, there has to be some food there that enables you to do, you know, what you want it to do. But beyond a certain point, particularly in the absence of that first stimulus, 
um, I, all kinds. I, I've kind of wondered sometimes if the health issues around obesity have more to do with, I'll try to word this so it's not confusing, with what you have to do to get fat rather than just actually being fat. I mean, I think there are probably some things about being fat that are not good, but it's how you get there that creates the health, uh, much, if not most of the health issues rather than the actual carrying of extra right. body. I, I, I would agree with that. I think it's the process of producing a chronic anabolic state that does not allow the opportunity for the corresponding um, catabolic or repair state to occur. Um, and you you're, can't you're be just continuously more. in that state because you're accumulating more and more um, both proteins, glucose, fats, all of it without any turnover of the more worn out components that you need to get rid of. So you're just moving more shit into your garage without ever having taken anything out. Right. And it's the process of doing that that turns you from, um, you know, first a, a neat and tidy person into a pack rat and then into a hoarder. It's just the length of time at which you continue to engage in that process. Right. And I like I say, I think that yeah, is people you often hear about obese people are in a chronically inflammatory state, but are is it the carrying of fat per se? I mean, this is probably one where nobody really knows, or maybe, maybe somebody does, because I'm thinking in the past there were times when putting on a whole bunch of fat so you could survive the long hard winter was probably a good thing. And right. I don't at that point carrying extra that fat. Is Again, there was a balance because that is true because a long anabolic state was then followed by a prolonged catabolic state. So even though the time scale was on a more macro scale, the balance still existed. But when the balance doesn't exist, chronic inflammation does ensue for multiple reasons. Um, one is senescent cells can't be cleaned out and they're secreting all sorts of inflammatory signals. Um, stored body fat um, it is largely precursors for inflammatory cytokines, especially if the stored body fat is, um, you know, the polyunsaturated type that we are getting from ingesting, you know, industrial seed oils and stuff. And now people are starting to poo-poo that a little bit, but it really is an important element to health. I mean, if you store a bunch of polyunsaturated fat in your fat cells, um, you are a powder keg of precursors for inflammatory cytokines. So, you know, those things matter. So I'm just gonna share my screen again. Mm -hmm. And so two things, uh, you, you had a, I have one of them highlighted here, but the fitness, oh, sorry, I didn't share yet. I need to click one more thing. So you had, I like in the book, you had a definition of fitness. And I don't know if you ever read back in the day, there was a book by Lawrence Morehouse, PhD, called Total Fitness in 30 Minutes a Week. Did you ever run into that one? I don't remember. I, it sounds familiar, but I don't um, explicitly remember it. So Lawrence Morehouse was the guy that used to uh, design uh, fitness programs for NASA astronauts. And basically, you know, he talked about, you know, doing squats and just a few very simple exercise. I, there was never any mention of high intensity or Arthur Jones or anything like that. But basically, he was saying that very little exercise uh, done, you know, intensely, mm -hmm. although he never talked about fit or anything like that. But he had pointed out that the word fitness in and of itself was a meaningless term in terms of you know fit because he would he'd say well fit for what but i like what you what you and uh john have done here uh the bodily state of being physiological physiologically capable of handling challenges that exist above a resting threshold of activity so i, I think it's somewhat vague somebody might say but i think it's deliberately so right yeah, because 
like the other author said, fit for what, um, how high you got to go above the resting threshold might determine what your definition of fitness is. If you got to perform um, extremely high levels of exertion for any sort of survival mechanism, being able to go there is one of the definitions of fitness. If you want to um, be functional, to be otherwise active in your life and career without pooping out or being able to play kids, play with the kids, play catch, you know, play tag, then that's a level of physiologic capability above a resting threshold that you would then define as fit and success. Um, different types of athletes have different um, levels that they have to go above that threshold by the very nature of their sport. So, you know, if you're playing billiards, it really does help to be in good physical condition but it's not nearly as critical as it is if you're playing soccer, you know? So um, it does, you know, somewhat beg the question and is deliberately vague because there is a fit for what kind of um, component to the question. Yeah. So here, exercise, uh, that just happens to be highlighted here because of the way that I search this in my Kindle app, so a specific activity, and this, of course, inevitably, comparisons come between this definition and Ken Hutchins' definition. So, as, or, and of course, any definitions that might be found in Webster's Dictionary, et cetera. A specific activity that stimulates a positive physiological adaptation that serves to enhance fitness and health and does not undermine the latter in the process of enhancing the former. So I, I think that's really well thought out and well put. Um, and I think about, um, you know, like a lot of times at one point we talked about the times when we were sort of maybe almost fanatical where we would stop a client on the street who was jogging or playing something and said, no, you can't do anything between workouts. You got to just recover, et cetera, et cetera. But, and then we realize now that we've gone too far the other way and doing that. But I, I do think to myself, you know, recently I've seen some of my clients posting on social media where they went through these mud runs. And these are people who are in our age group and yeah. maybe a little older. And part of me, an analogy that I'm using is if you had a car and you could never buy a new car and when that car didn't run anymore, your life was over. Right. How would Why you would drive you to the demolition derby? <laughs> how would you how would you drive that car? Right? Because yeah. when I'm thinking about some of these activities, and I understand you got a car, it's fun to drive, you want to drive it, but if you stop and think of it that way, it's the only car you're ever gonna have. And when it doesn't run anymore, you're done. It sort of puts it a, a bit of a context to right. things. And going back, i uh, sorry, I stopped sharing there, but your definition is just to say, yeah. it's not undermine the latter, meaning health, in the process of enhancing the former. Yeah, it's kind of cool. I remember hashing out that definition with John right here in this room, um, over the phone together. And uh, we came up with that, and we were very happy with it. And I still like it because it is there are mechanisms by which people seek fitness that does undermine the latter in the attempt to gain the former. So CrossFit being a perfect example of that. You can generate some fitness by beating a tractor tire with a sledgehammer, but it's going to wreak havoc on your rotator cuff and there are going to be negative health consequences for having sought fitness through that avenue. Um, and then these other things like these mud runs and Spartan races and things like that, those aren't even really, that, that's just kind of showing off your physical conditioning while putting your health at risk to do it. It's basically just um, a, a big ego display with very significant risks associated with it. Especially because these are things for which 
no one truly trains for it or develops um, a refined skill in it. You don't really refine the skill of, you know, climbing a log wall and throwing yourself over it or jumping a mud hole, you know. Well, and earlier you're talking about athletes and we we're talking about training for a certain event. And we talked about, you know, most of strength training's benefits going to be injury prevention. And I, you know, I've told people before, all things being equal, two athletes, uh, if you got one that's stronger than the other, but another one is more skillful than the stronger one, skill will trump uh, strength every time. You know, with obviously, if it, maybe not in powerlifting, but you know what I mean. In most athletes, yeah. skill, yeah. like people say, I want to get stronger to improve my golf swing. Well, getting stronger is going to be a step in the right direction. But bottom line is your golf swing is a very complex technical right. thing that you need to practice and get real. I'm mean, just talking from a non-golfer, but that skill will always trump. But, you know, to say that a mud run or something like that is a, a demonstration. You remember the old Arthur Jones, the idea of demonstrating versus building strength. But mm -hmm. to me, if you're doing an activity that you've never done before uh, and you have no skill at, you could be really fit and come across as being if if you're using that as a measure, you could come across as being in horrible shape because yeah. you're simply doing something that that you're not either well suited for and you have and you're like I'm like if you look in the dictionary under the word klutz, they have my picture there, right? Yeah. I have no, I have no natural athletic <laughs> ability whatsoever, and so you know it's not even a, a good uh, barometer of how fit you are. I don't think. Yeah. So, and, and uh, anyway, so it's I find this interesting. I actually have Ken's definition in my gym in a poster, but I'm thinking. I like this one because Ken's is good, but I think it goes into some specifics that maybe are not necessary, like the, the minutia that's involved yeah. in it. And there's a few things in there that don't necessarily really apply anymore. You know, performing muscular work of a demanding nature is like, well, if you're doing time static contractions, you're not doing work. Work is well, forced time distance if there's no movement. You know, so yeah, I don't have it in front of me, but he talks about muscular growth. I think there's growth or hypertrophy somewhere in there. Yeah. What I think adaptation, like, is right? And how many people doing super slow following that definition have done it for years without an appreciable ounce of visible growth, right? Well, you know, but I mean, and and all of us, we you know. And this is a whole other bag of worms, but I have commented on that hypertrophy is a negatively regulated side effect of the adaptive response. It's one that we see and we kind of get jonesed about early in the game, but that curve is really steep and then it goes really flat and it takes incredible effort to get that to creep up from that little horizontal flat stage even tiny increments. Um, and, you know, the only thing that really reliably gets that curve to go steep again is performance enhancing drugs because that unlock, unlocks the negative regulation around that side effect. Well, and I think maybe to, to summarize, because I think we're running out of time, just a, a, maybe a comment, philosophically speaking or morally, whatever it is, as I look at things on social media, and I'm thinking of exercise, I'm thinking of politics, I'm thinking of people who lure people into Ponzi screens or stuff like that. Yeah. It seems that the order of the day is if you're going to exaggerate, don't exaggerate a little bit. Go all out. Yeah. Don't, you know, don't, uh, don't just say, I'll get you a little bit better results. Tell people you a 28-day chair yoga program and there's a guy in there and he's saying this is where you are on day 12 there's a guy on day 17 on day 28 you look like a magazine cover model and of course uh, politicians are not they're going to they're going to solve everything everything is going to be wonderful and and of course the people who are 
you know, financial planners will tell people, you know, not just, you know, slow and steady wins the race and be calm. No, no, we're going to make give you 37 percent returns and things like that. And yeah. what I find frustrating is I know why people do it because it works. Right. Because it's almost like tell people what they want to hear. Right. And it's like, yeah. Nobody wants to hear, well, you know, slow and steady wins the race and it's going to take a long time and you're going to have to apply yourself and and your results. Yeah, will. I mean, all the all the wealth gurus online, you know, it's like. If you really got as wealthy as you say you did by the means that you say you did it, why are you online selling courses about it and spending all your time traveling around giving courses about it? it's like that's where you're making your money not with the the mechanisms or, or the techniques that you are selling didn't make your money. It's selling the technique that makes your money. Otherwise, you wouldn't be hustling so damn hard to do this. And if there were a way to get, look like a magazine mock, because if you look around and I've done this and it's getting worse and worse, you know, you look, and this is terrible, this is self-righteous, but, you know, I, I, I go to... Uh, a family event or or uh, just a public place and I look around and I do this this self-righteous and I say I look around and I say okay who in the group looks fit yeah and it's like nobody and then when I was playing pickup hockey now there's a better group right because they're guys who play hockey regularly and, and in the dressing room of course you get to see a lot of men without their clothes on and I'm thinking, here are guys who would love to have big muscles. If you can get in shape in 28 days, people who look noticeably fit and muscular, not just fit, but muscular, would be abounding all over the place. Yeah. Right? But they're far and few between so that they stand out as much as when you see somebody who's six foot seven or six foot eight. Yeah. And then you right. go up. And, or yeah. stated differently, if these if these programs that are sold are selling at the rate to make these people rich, then we ought to be flooded with people with great results and we're not. Yeah, exactly. And it, you but, know, if you're but, selling enough of this to make yourself a millionaire, where's all your success stories, you know? So yeah. but anyway, <laughs> I think I think I, I'm not looking closely. I think we started, I got on a little early, but I think we're coming to the end of the hour. Okay. Any parting okay. words or anything uh, that you'd like to leave listeners with from our conversation? No, I think despite everything that we discussed and a lot of our discussion about, you know, there being limits to the hypertrophy aspect of which is what you and I are interested in. I think that the real benefits and many of the unseen benefits from resistance exercise are just... Um, way, way understated. And I think there's a lot to be gained from it by ignoring all the minutia and the chatter and just doing the basics really, really well over the long term um, provides unimaginable benefits. Right. Even yeah, if the it, hypertrophy creeps along at a snail's pace. Yeah, some things are way overstated and the really important, probably much more important things are understated. understated. Because they're less visible. But anyway, that would be it. Thank you very much for your time, sir. Right. Always a pleasure. Yeah, likewise. We'll talk to you the next time. All right. All right. Bye. Bye.